Today we have the great joy and blessing to have uh, with us uh, Dr. Engelhardt, who is uh, a professor in uh, the Rice University in Texas. And it's a great blessing for us because uh, he is here at uh, St. Luke's Cathedral in Hong Kong. And we have the opportunity to discuss about uh, some uh, moral issues. And uh, I think, uh, Dr. Engelhardt, uh, I have to welcome you and to set the first question. Uh, you have uh, involved in bioethics issues and uh, it's a very uh, a joy for us to know about uh, the different approaches of a Western and Eastern tradition, yes. Christian tradition, about uh, these moral issues and about these problems that uh, have to do with uh, bioethics today. Well, I think the greatest difference is one that you usually make in your sermons. Christ did not come teaching philosophy or giving sermons on bioethics. He didn't really even preach morality. He preached repentance and an invitation for me no longer to love myself. And through prayer and almsgiving and fasting, to finally love him with all my heart and my neighbor as myself. The difference between the ancient Christian understanding of morality and bioethics and what developed in the West later is Orthodox Christianity continued to recognize that everything turns on loving God rightly and in terms of loving God rightly loving my neighbor rightly, because only if I love God rightly can I love my neighbor rightly. Studying books will not help me at all if my heart is closed. What made the West different were, as you know, many changes. Uh, one, the development of the Western Empire under Charlemagne in the year 800, uh, and the entrance through Charlemagne of a different way of doing theology. You talk today about a great theologian of the 20th century, Elder Paisius. He wasn't a great theologian because he published a lot of books or got honorary doctorates, which may be a stumbling block for salvation. He was a great theologian because he loved God, and because he loved God, he knew God, not just about God, but he knew God. So the difference was the emergence in the 13th century in the West of a totally different view of theology, and therefore moral philosophy, and therefore of bioethics. Crucial were a number of small, but in the end very important changes. The University of Paris was founded in the year 1208. Already in the year 1210 there was a large dispute about the fact that Aristotelian thought was coming in and changing the way people looked at morality. Thomas Aquinas, who lived between 1225 and 1274, played a large role in a cultural synthesis that created a brand new way of looking at religion, morality, and bioethics, because he brought together Aristotelian thought, Stoic thought, and Christian thought, and created an approach to morality and bioethics that was highly academic. Uh, Christ, I, I hope God will forgive me for being an academic, uh, but I was called to be a lover of God and a lover of my neighbor, and what bioethics has to be, a real Christian bioethics, is about how to love God and love my neighbor in all the areas that medicine touches. And what went wrong in the West is the thought that moral philosophy could tell me what God wanted. And so moral philosophy and morality became a third thing between God and man. And the well, Christian bioethics of the West became a third thing between God and man. It was a philosophical teaching. But again, we know Christ did not come uh, preaching philosophy or preaching morality, but repentance of love and love of God and our neighbor. So everything changed. A good example is how the West began to look then at end-of-life decision-making. Orthodox Church had always said that it, medicine is a gift of God and we should use it. St. Basil the Great, who lived for between 329 and 379, 
in his Long Rules, question 55. The question is, should you use medicine? And the answer is yes. However, if you put all your trust in a physician, you're a fool. <laughs> Only one has to, when using everything, always be directing towards God. And he said, one should use medicine, but if the treatment is going to turn my own physical life into an idol, or distract me from God, then I should step back. So everything is to aim me at salvation, to loving God with all my heart and my soul and my neighbor as myself. None of that is a natural law or scholastic answer. What happened by the 16th century, uh, in the beginning of the 17th century, such Roman Catholic scholastics as Francisco Victoria and Nunez and others uh, began to make very scholastic legal views and the answer is put in natural law terms. I have a natural law duty to save my life unless the probability of success is too small or the cost too high. Well, there's a good sense in that but Christ is no longer mentioned. What one has done is created a natural law approach. Orthodox Christianity never did that. We understood that all the decisions about whether to use medicine or not to use medicine could only be answered in terms of my spiritual father deciding what will bring me to Christ and what won't. One can't have scholastic rules and one can't have a scholastic ca uh, casuistry to God. In some sense the law is made for each of us. My spiritual father uh, a wonderful man who, unfortunately, is now a bishop. Uh, but you know how hard it is to be a bishop. Uh, but uh, he reminds me again and again that uh, I can still be saved if I'm an academic, but if I think I can reason through what God ought to say, that's the beginning of sin. And the West was always tempted. It was a temptation of the philosopher. So this example about the difference of how St. Basil the Great responds in question 55 of the Long Road and how differently it becomes uh, in the 17th century with the manualist tradition in the West, uh, became disengaged from life in God. Uh, it, that's why we at times, as Orthodox Christians, will use proofs for the existence of God. We only take them as rhetorical, to open your heart. To take seriously five proofs for the existence of God is to think that, well, you no longer experience God. I've been traveling a lot if I come home and my wife says I have five proofs for your existence it means I've become distant and this whole scholastic philosophical framework removed the West connection from God which led to the enlightenment and then the attempt to try to do bioethics after God and the second of bioethics that is one step further it develops out of this Western view but now it's not just that reason can do as well as faith but you don't need faith. And the result is an attempt to create a bioethics without God, which means as if the universe came from nowhere, we're going nowhere, and for no ultimate purpose. And the result then is the rebirth of a pagan bioethics that supports physician-assisted suicide. We know as Orthodox Christians, I may never kill myself, I'll kill another. Uh, this circumstance that now abortion is central to the life of much of the secular West and the secular bioethics supports it. So what happened was a stepwise return to pagan understandings in part because of the embrace of pagan philosophy in the 13th century that tried to turn morality again to a third thing between me and God and make moral philosophy the shepherd of that. Forgive me for the long answer, but I think that's the reason we, we Orthodox Christians are so different. We're not called to uh, uh, preach philosophy. We're supposed to preach that the Messiah of Israel, the Son of the Living God, has come, and He will forgive my sins if I only repent. Some people say that uh, now we live nowadays in a post-Christian world. Is that true? In one sense, yes, and in one sense, no. In one sense, yes, on the 28th of October, 312, St. Constantine the Great won the battle at the Milvian Bridge. 
and then on September 18th, 324, at Chrysopolis, he won the final battle against Gideonus, and Christendom was established. We've lived off of the inheritance of Constantine for almost 1,700 years. We now have very, we have a new kind of fundamentalism, secular fundamentalist states, where one is never supposed to mention in public God, especially when God's only begotten son came as the Messiah of Israel. So in that sense, we're after Christendom. I'm old enough to remember when America was still a Christian country. Prayers were sent in Protestant hospitals. And now it's a regressively, at the official level, a post-Christian. It's becoming a secular fundamentalist state. France is probably an example of a near secular fundamentalist state because of its liaison commitments, not just after the French Revolution, but after Ferré at the end of the 19th century. Laicism became part of it. So in that sense, we're after Christendom. But we're not after Christianity. Christianity lives as in the pagan world. When I, I became Orthodox in 1991, now in Houston there must be 20 Orthodox churches. The Orthodox church I go to is 60% converts. Under my spiritual father, Bishop Thomas, 80% of his priests are converts and 60% of the laity. So Orthodox Christianity is growing. The Christianity that's dying out is a Christianity that is very philosophical and one that doesn't want to take God seriously. Even a person who's an agnostic knows that if God exists, he would be very, very significant that he would claim all of our lives. It's not one can't domesticate God. I tell people that uh, you're a celibate, so you don't know how this is, but God is worse than a wife. My wife only, uh, when I come to Hong Kong, I can turn the air conditioning down very low. She likes it up higher. I, I get to do things on my own, but I can never get away from God. God is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. God's a very serious matter. And any religion that doesn't tell people God's a serious matter is not a serious religion. And what has happened is many of the Western Christianities have ceased to take God seriously and much rather uh, take philosophy seriously. You know that we have some problems uh Maybe I have to say moral or ethical problems nowadays, as, uh, for example, the marriage of the same sex. And uh, the churches, the different churches or uh, the religions, they try to give some answers or their opinion about mm -hmm. these problems. And uh, some people, they claim that the Orthodox Church is uh, something fundamentalistic sure. uh, in the, their opinion about all these matters. Is that true? Well, again, I'll say, like oh, all professors, in one sense yes, in one sense no. First, the origin of the term fundamentalist developed at the very beginning of the 20th century by Protestants who were reacting against very liberal Protestants who denied the virgin birth, denied Christ was God, denied Christ rose from the dead, and they published a set of 12 pamphlets called the Fundamentals, saying that you, one was not a Christian unless one believed Christ was born of the Virgin Mary. He was the Son of God. He died for us on the cross. He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He will come again, and you can trust the Bible. Those were the Fundamentals. Now, in that sense, anyone who recited the Creed today the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed is a fundamentalist. So the first time it was used was in criticism against German Protestants who had been very influenced by Feuerbach and Hegel and Kant. So in that sense, we are fundamentalists. We know all of these things are true. And many of uh, Western Christianities 
are not fundamentalists anymore. They deny the virgin birth or the actual resurrection. So in this sense, being a fundamentalist is good. It's about the truth of the universe. The second way fundamentalism has come to be used is by very famous uh, secular philosophers. A good example is John Rawls, uh, but also Habermas, that anyone who holds that religion has a truth that secular thought cannot set aside is a fundamentalist. Well, in that sense, I'm truly a fundamentalist. Uh, I will follow Christ, and I know his truth endures, and I know that philosophical fashions come and go. I teach the history of thought. So in that sense, yes, I'm a fundamentalist. I hold to the fundamentals of Christian belief, and I hold to the truth of Christianity. So fundamentalism used in a very sloppy fashion. It usually just means I don't like you because you believe in God seriously. But Christianity, since we know God lives, we know his law doesn't change. So I must know that all sexuality happens only within the marriage of a man and woman. That's not negotiable. It's because that's how God says, if I do that, I'll aim at him. I'm called to aim at him and not miss the mark by his teaching me what it is to be man and woman. Uh, in Genesis, as soon as he made humans, he said, it, and he made them male and female. And when Christ Almighty talks about marriage, he quotes the passage. He said that from the beginning, he made them male and female. And that's a shocking thing because it tells that men and women are different. That it's, a di it's not only talking about uh, only heterosexual marriage and only becoming one flesh in marriage, because St. Paul talks about becoming how bad it is to become one flesh with someone not one's wife. But it's a gender essentialism. Men and women are different in, a, in an order. If you don't, if one thinks one's a philosopher, one can say, well, maybe I can reason a way around what Christ said. If God is truly transcendent, He transcends all my concepts. Therefore, all my ways of deceiving myself, and I must aim at Him, as He calls me to be aimed. And the remarkable thing, if one looks at the fathers, everything we need for bioethics is there. St. John Chrysostom, in commenting on the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians, says that men and women are called not to multiply like plants, but joining their flesh. He already has given the answer why cloning would be wrong. We reproduce not by reproducing like plants, which would be like cloning. We do it in being joined in one flesh as we were called in Genesis and is blessed by Christ. But we're arrogant people. I'm a proud person, and that's the greatest sin that I have. As I said, God is worse than a wife. I hear turn turn down the air conditioning. With God, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, I have to aim at Him. And that's, that's hard for all of us. That, that's one of the great joys of confession. As my spiritual father would say, there's no one I can deceive better than myself. And, that's, uh, and of course, philosophers can do it in a very wonderfully academic fashion. So, uh, the great difference between how Orthodox Christianity answers questions of how to live our lives and what developed in the West we know that the way to live our life is given by a transcendent God. And if we aim towards God as He asks us, we will be saved. And we're guided not by academic theologians, but by theologians such as St. Paisius the Great. Protestants believe different things all over the world. Roman Catholics believe different things over time. I travel about a quarter of a million kilometers a year. I go to Serbian church. Everywhere the Orthodox Church believes one thing, and that's because the Holy Spirit lives. And that's to say that what we understood about choices about abortion, homosexuality, physician-assisted suicide, euthanasia, which were really discussed in the pagan, pagan world, remain the same now, for Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And only the Church, that's a, a body of is the, body, is the body of Christ and the Holy Spirit it can be the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And anything that isn't, isn't part of the church. 
You know that recently we have the creation of a pan-Orthodox committee uh, with the purpose to face and to discuss all these uh, serious issues about bioethics. Yes. Uh, do you think that the Orthodox Church has uh, something to give in the modern world? And what are the most uh, serious problems that we have to discuss? I think the most serious thing is to remind academics that the real theologians are people like St. Paisius. What a man like I can do, I can come up with new answers. All the old answers are there and enough for us today. All I can do is communicate it and I can say something about the history that made it hard in the year 2011 to listen to the word of the gospel, just as it was hard in the pagan world. So I think that academics can be good communicators of the unchanging truth of the church. And we have to see how we are different as orthodox from what developed in the West elsewhere. I put here a book I've published, unfortunately, may God forgive me for publishing so much, <laughs> I publish a journal through Oxford called mm. Christian Bioethics. It has the provocative subtitle, Non-Ecumenical Studies in Medical Morality. And the reason is we tell the, everyone who should contribute, they should articulate their view. And we will discuss very honestly and lovingly that we should see our differences so that we can understand what it is that the church has already ta always taught. So I think discussions uh, are very important. You'll see this issue, which was in April this year, is talking about the widening gulf between Christians and a secular world. We're returning to a world uh, which is secular as the pagan world had been. So it goes back to your question, uh, is Christianity over? No, Christendom is over, Christianity lives. Uh, but we will be thought of in bad terms as the martyrs were th thought of in bad terms. And calling us fundamentalists is just one way to say, I very much disagree with your holding that there really is a God who lives and who is always the same, and he calls all to us on his terms, not my terms. I know that you have very heavy schedule, and I'm grateful and very thankful for your time today. Thanks a lot for this uh, short discussion, and I think that next time we will have the opportunity to discuss most, most, uh, more things because uh, you are a man and uh, you are a faithful with a rich experience and uh, outside and inside the church. <laughs> it would be a great pleasure. Yeah, it would be a pleasure. Thanks a lot and uh, we look forward uh, to see you again here in Hong Kong. Please keep me in your holy prayers.